The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey everybody, nice to see you. We are doing the Bronx Buzz today, and uh, this is the program where we talk to Bronx journalists, Bronx photographers, sometimes videographers, just to give you insight as to uh, who the people are who are writing for you in uh, the various newspapers and blogs and websites and everything else, and also give you some insight as to what they're thinking about when they put uh, pen or nowadays uh, you know, digital or computer or phone to paper or to your favorite website or whatever it is. And uh, this evening we are thrilled, and, and I'm going to try not to mispronounce names. It is uh, Rachel Ripito is with us, and uh, Mankapur Conte. Did I get that right? You did. I tried my best. Who are both uh, with both the Mott Haven Herald and the Hunts Point Express, right? Um, which means they are student journalists, and which means we are really thrilled to have them because this is the future of journalism and in some ways the future of the Bronx. So uh, Rachel, nice to have you with us. Thank you. And Mankapur, nice to have you. Let's start with you, Rachel. Sure. Um, generally, students who come through the um, uh, CUNY J School are not from the Bronx. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, so wow. not from the Bronx. That and is when, true. when did you come here, and and what was the objective uh, coming here? Um, I just I got here two months ago. Oh maybe. wow! Yeah, so recent. Wow. It's been a learning what, curve. What can we do? A welcome to the Bronx, to Rachel <laughs> Ripita. Um, and what, what, why did you why did you come here? Oh. What, what's the thing? Uh, it's a great program at CUNY. Um, I I was looking to come to New York, um, and I was also looking to do uh, community based reporting, uh, and so uh, that was a really good opportunity to get to work with the Mott Haven and the Hunts Point to kind of uh -huh. do that. Um, at what point in your life did the light bulb light up and you say, you know what, I think I want to do this? Or were you the sort of person who said, well, I've always done this, you know, and you kind of floated downstream and said, well, maybe now I'll do this? I think it's a little bit of both. Of both. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, journalism's kind of followed me. I've just um, I've, I've tried to get away from it because it's scary and <laughs> it's hard it's to get scary. jobs. It was, or it was when I was first Isn't, coming into listen, college. We know about that, yeah. yeah, we know about that. So, um, but I, I found that it was, uh, it was the only thing that I, I, I cared the most about. It's kind of like being, um, it's kind of like knowing a little bit about a lot. And I, mm -hmm. I really, I really enjoyed it. You that. wanted to know a lot about a lot. Of I course, to know we a lot hope our journalists do. Yeah. <laughs> Were you a good writer, like through? No, you went to college somewhere, we presume. Yeah, University of Portland in Oregon. Okay, in Oregon. Yeah. Um, and so, were you a good writer, and did you say, "Gee, I'm a writer, and now I can apply this"? Is that what happened? Yeah, it's kind of funny. I started as a writer, and um, I think I've actually—I don't know if I've gotten any better at writing since I've been a journalist. I think. Well, I've, I've only seen some of the stuff <laughs> you've done in the um, uh, My Name and Herald, uh, so I can't judge. Compare it to the past. Well, um, but I think I, I started to enjoy the reporting aspect of it even more. So really? I think that's. Uh, uh, define what you mean by reporting. Um, talking to people, going to communities, um, and, and sort of having access to information. Mm. Uh, I'm going to seed the clouds with this, and I'm going to say the reason that you enjoy it so much is because you're here in the borough of the Bronx, mm. and there's a lot to learn, and it's quite a place, right? Yes, there is. We're going to get to you, back to you about that, but let's talk to uh, Mankapur Kante. Nice to have you. So where are you from? I grew up in Bear, Delaware. Bear, the B E A R. Bear, like the animal. B E A R, okay. Delaware. And um, I guess really the same line of questioning. What, what, when did the light bulb ring? Uh, how long have you been here? Also from the beginning of the semester, a couple. Of I've months? lived in uh, Brooklyn in Bed Stuy since November of last year. Okay. Um, I started off working. I've always been a journalist, but I was working in communications for a race and gender justice nonprofit mm. um, downtown Brooklyn. Um, and in the midst of that, I applied to journalism school. So I've been in New York for almost a year. Tell me a little bit, of, again, the same question. When did the light bulb hit, or you know, was it just gee, you always were in your class or neighborhood, you were always the one with the pen and paper? Um, I was not allowed to watch uh, like regular, like comedic, like fun TV after 6 o'clock in my house. After 6 o'clock, mm. we watched CNN. 
and we watched local news. And ever since then, I was just exposed to all the different ways and all the different stories that wow. one could tell. And so I was like, I want to do that. I want to meet people and talk to them and, and share information with the world. It inspired you. Did par your parents presumably made those rules? Yes, yes. they did. And, and did they do that with this idea in mind that, hey, Mankapur is going to grow up and do something like this? Or was it that just the way we, you know, what they believed was important in the home? I think they just wanted me to uh, be aware of what was happening in the world. My family are uh, Sierra Leonean immigrants, and they knew that there was a lot more to life than so SpongeBob. They to learn. <laughs> wow. Yeah, they they wanted me to be a global citizen. I think. Yeah, listen, I, not to get political, but we're going to get political. This is the beauty of immigration. These are the beauty of people coming from another place with a different point of view, with learning about our culture, and then having somebody who's going to potentially really contribute. And that's my editorial comment. <laughs> Presumably you agree. I do. I'm sure you do. Um, tell me about, um, oh, now where did you go to college? I went to Wake Forest University oh, in Wake North Forest, Carolina. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, just a hop, skip, and a jump from uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Never made the trip over. Yeah, I guess <laughs> uh, from, from Bear, Delaware, actually. Um, uh, talk to me about um, your experiences now in the Bronx. So you came here, no, you've been in Brooklyn, so New York wasn't new, but maybe you could even compare uh, the Bronx and Brooklyn. And the reason that I'm asking is those of us in the Bronx, we always want to hear what other people have to say. So what's your impressions? What have you found here? Well, one of the things, I think it, I don't know, I would have to explore, you know, do some investigation. Uh, into how different my experiences are regionally um, because I was working around a lot of people who um, I think their politics um, might be sympathetic to the primary candidates. We just had a, pr a Democratic primary that did not win. Um, and so I, was, I did my very first story for the Mott Haven Herald on primary day out in front of the Mott Haven Houses Community Center talking to folks about who they voted for. Mm -hmm. uh, and it Covering the Amanda Septimo uh, Carmen Arroyo race, yes, for example? Yes, for example. Um, and then, of course, the gubernatorial primary race. Right. And I was uh, taken out of sort of the bubble that I probably exist in where there was a lot of energy and excitement around these people who are challenging the incumbents. But everybody that I talked to, with the exception of one person, were supporting Cuomo, uh, were supporting uh, Tish James, were supporting um, Carmen Arroyo and folks that had been sort of known which Democratic is, which figures. Which is why presumably some of them, they won. They <laughs> yeah, and so it, it, uh, I think it, it was a good introduction to the ways that people are thinking about their communities and what's actually going to make them better. You, you were exposed then to the beautiful diversity of the Bronx because you never know when you talk to people. Now we have trends and, and listen, political trends and you can do all the marketing, but once you start to talk to people, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm well prejudiced toward the Bronx and people who watch you know, my work here on BronxNet know that. Um, but you never really know what you're going to get. I mean, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that, that fits what you're telling me? Uh, that I never really know what you're going to get. Yeah, I think that there's definitely a lot of surprises. There's a lot of commonalities amongst people that I've talked to, but some diversity too. Like the one person that I spoke to uh, that was supporting the challengers was an older woman who was voting with her adult daughter and who said, I've been here for years and years and years and I'm ready for a change. So that was surprising That's, to me. That it again, the sure. And so then on the other hand, you have a, a quote unquote progressive movement, which was largely successful in, in uh, you know, throughout the, the state of New York. But in fact, the governor won, and that was not an insurgent candidate. Mm -hmm. So anyway, well, that, that's great. I'm going to ask you the same thing. What sure. do you? What have you learned about the Bronx? What have you discovered coming from, let's see, T Nashville, Tennessee, by way of uh, where Eugene, Oregon, or wherever the heck Southern it is? Oregon, yeah. um, uh, what's um, it been like? You know, I, especially in looking at it from a housing and development lens, which is what I cover for the Mount Haven Herald, um, I see in some ways what developers see. I see. Um, the ways of the Bronx um, is really a nice place to live. You know, there's a lot of open space. There's a lot of community. It feels more like a neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, than other parts of Manhattan or other parts of uh, even Brooklyn at this point in time. Um, you know, you see, you see less. You see more sky. <laughs> um, and and, and, and there's yeah, and 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 you know, like I, I've definitely I've been around the housing developments, um, and I've experienced mostly kindness, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, I'm always interested, especially working in the Bronx and living in the Bronx as long as I have, in stereotype busters. Yeah. What you have experienced, it sounds like, 
you know, if, if you were to tell people I'm in the Bronx, I'm sure you've heard what they're saying about it. And you're yeah. like, well, wait a minute. You're in some very cool people. It's a very cool place, right? I, it's I the place to be. Some people are a little concerned about it being the place to be, but it, it's becoming what, the what place to be. What do you mean by that? Um, I, I think that, you know, the Bronx is becoming the new frontier. Oh, because you know, people coming people from coming somewhere in. else. Yeah, they're developers who are really interesting in buy, interested in buying up land. You, you know, this is a an ongoing question, and, I, and, and since you're only here a couple of months, I'm only going to ask your impression, not for a definitive conclusion. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is the nagging question. We, we have poverty. We have health issues. I mean, all those Trash. issues we know about. Is it possible to develop the Bronx to bring the economy up to uh, assist people? I mean, we've got the poorest congressional district in the nation here. Um, is it possible to do that and not throw the people who built the Bronx out? But she just raised her eyebrow. She was like, whoa, that's the qu that is That's the, the that's million the dollar quest. question. And that, is. and that is what people are trying to figure out. Um, you know, there are definitely, there have been proposals for ways to do that. Um, and this is what you'll see. There's a new sort of buzzword that's coming up in the South Bronx called a community land trust. Um, and, and this is kind of their solution to that is this is a way to make the Bronx a nice place to be, um, but keep the people who have been living here for long periods of time here because In rents ownership. aren't going up. Keep the ownership of the land, decide what they're going to use that land for, um, and not raise rents, not raise property taxes. I can tell you from, from a um, kind of an advocate political point of view, there's a lot of passion in the Bronx and don't tread on us. You know, it was a, a phrase of Freddie Ferrer um, uh, invented uh, maybe about 20 years ago, don't dump on the Bronx. People, more than ever, and I've been here a long time, really take it to heart. Yeah, but what's interesting is the chasms between those two people, or between those people. You know, you have groups that, that want the same thing but have really different ideas I of know. how to get it. It's crazy, right? Yeah. And, it, and listen, I know for, as a journalist it's a joy because you're really going to find something. Let's just ask you also impressions of, um, of the Bronx and, and those kinds of things. Yeah, so I'm reporting on uh, crime and around that I'm also interested in policing. Uh, and so I got the opportunity to attend a Build the Block gathering. That story that you wrote, I have to say, was fascinating because I, I'm going to interject with because we only got a minute left. Mm -hmm. um, that story was fascinating because one would think when you do those kind of conversations between the community and police, everybody's going to go, oh, how nice. It was so nice to talk to them. But the people in the Bronx didn't didn't give give up. I mean, they, they kept right at it, right? Yeah, there are definitely issues that um, the officers that I encountered, um, I think we're trying to take heed of, but there were there was a lot of listening that needed to happen. There's a lot of uh, things that folks in the communities I've been able to uh, observe really want to get off their chest. Um, we're, we're essentially out of time. I'd love to review some of the stuff you guys have written. We've already talked about one story uh, you have written. I'm hoping you're going to keep writing about the Bronx, and I'm I'm begging you to come back. Let's let's really now that we know who you are. Roll up your sleeves. Now, you're going to be here for a little while now, right? Yeah. Uh, a year, two years, five years, ten years, a hundred years. All the years. All the years. All the years. And you two are the same? At least, at the very least, two years. All right, we'll see what go. happens. Uh, Moncapur Conte, thank you so much. And Rachel Ripito, thank you. Keep writing. Keep learning about the Bronx. Bring us a fresh attitude. Bring us honesty. All those great things. And, and we'll, we'll all get along really well. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, they are with the CUNY J School, the Mott Haven Herald, and the Hunts Point Express. Now, we're going to go from young journalist to, I don't want to say an old guy, but the guy who wrote this uh, landmark article on uh, the Bronx Democratic Party, David Cruz, who's the editor of the Norwood News, but this appeared in City and State for their Bronx Power 50 edition. He's going to be with us. We're going through this article. We're going to ask him every little thing about it. Don't go away. Sure, I look cute now, but when my owner lost his job, it was rough. I was living on the street, and one night, me and this Cocker Spaniel got into it so bad, I wound up looking like an ice cream cone. I cried a little bit, but thankfully I got rescued, so I'm running, I'm jumping, all back to my old self. And I'm ready to give unconditional love, even if you put a lampshade on my head. It's not always easy being a dad. Do you have panda asthma too? Does that run in the family? 
This is the home of the most priceless kung fu artifacts. But when you make an effort... Dad, we're not supposed to touch anything. Oh, sorry. Go along, son. It's always worth it. Whoa, master! The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. I am gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov to learn more. You know what, guys? There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably move the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea. This is Tess from Vivo's Do Your Selfie, where we recreate the hottest looks from today's biggest music videos. After cleaning out our closet, we have a lot of clothes we don't wear anymore. Like this old t-shirt. It's not garbage, it's actually a brand new rug. And to make it, all you need to do is cut, tie, and glue. Cut the t-shirt into strips. Tie the strips into knots. And glue the knots to the bath mat. I love it. Give your garbage another life. And recycle. Hey, back with you on the Bronx Buzz, and then we're rolling up our sleeves. I should really <laughs> roll up my sleeves. David Cruz is here, editor of the Norwood News. Uh, David, you wrote the cover story, which was in the uh, Bronx Power 50 edition of City and State. Congratulations on, on getting the big magazine story. Um, give me an idea of, from the beginning. What were you thinking about when you said, okay, um, it's my job to interview uh, Marcos Crespo, who is the chair of the Bronx Democratic County Committee? Well, I thought about the relevance of the party in terms of the aftermath following the win for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The fact that she did not get party support, but still won, kind of called into question the relevance of these parties and whether or not they're as effective as they, they were, say, like a decade ago. And so that was kind of like the, the underlying theme throughout my entire interview with uh, Crespo. And I think, you know, it gave him the opportunity to express like kind of like his, his frustration toward the fact that people think that the De Bronx Democratic Party specifically is not as progressive as, say, Ocasio-Cortez's uh, Cortez. platform. They're essentially the same, according to him. And so he pretty much uh, wanted to make known that that was a, a sort of a sore point on on his part. He just didn't understand why there was this. Uh, uh, well, I, I, you know, if he was sitting right next to you here and I heard you say that, I would ask the question, <laughs> well, then why don't you and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, why haven't you gotten together? He says they, he says he reached out to her. But well, he, he says he did, but she wasn't interested. Well, then there you go. Then that's really right. on her, then, that's right? A fair, that's a fair <laughs> enough, I guess, a fair enough answer. Um, and then also, just within the context of Al Alessandra Biagi, she ended up uh, unseating Jeff Klein. I think that's an easier one, and, and we both know that uh, last night uh, we both attended the uh, Power 50 uh, uh, gala, or whatever you call it, and um, he was very complimentary to her. Correct. There certainly seems, I think he's more comfortable working with her. Uh, then with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, although maybe what you say is true, that it's on her if she wants to, you know, work with us or not. Um, he re responded to the, the headline. I don't know if you can see the headline there. It says, Last Machine Standing. He didn't said he didn't like the word machine. First of all, did you write the headline? 
I did not. Uh, I, did, I didn't think you did. You and really I did ask him, what do you think of the term machine? He says, well, you know, some days I like it, some days I don't like it. He was very, it was a very gray area for him. I didn't quite understand the answer. It sounded as if, in this case, he didn't like the fact that it was referred to as a machine. You know, I did not attend. They had their um, kind of annual meeting, public meeting, and there apparently was some great uh, disagreements about opportunities for uh, green, uh, I almost said green grass, uh, you know, um, Grassroots? Uh, grassroots is what I'm thinking <laughs> of. Uh, advocates to have access to, you know, some of the, the state committees. Uh, I, I, as I said, I didn't follow it that carefully. Um, but that would, that kind of a thing still would suggest that there's a machine out there and that people are not able to really got entree into the party. Well, here's the thing. The, anyone can be part of what they call the county committee. You just essentially need to get the right signatures and a certain number of signatures to get on the uh, to get on the ballot, which will then put you on the committees. You know, depending on whether right. or not people actually vote for you on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't imagine that the uh, the party is intentionally blocking anyone per se. They're just not letting anyone know about the process. So they're sort of taking a step back, but they're not blocking anyone. I mean, that's interesting. It's almost a de facto blocking, so to speak. Um, They've suffered some losses. Let's face it. The Jeff Klein loss is a, is a, a huge loss. Certainly the Joe Crowley loss was a, a major loss. Uh, so let's answer your original question. Um, are machine politics really being de-emphasized, not only in the Bronx, but across the city of New York? Or is this party still going to be able to do things and throw people off ballots and maneuver um, uh, campaigns so that uh, you know it comes out the way they want? I'm going to say yes. Um, say one, yes that it's still there still is machine politics. I'm going to say yes, and I'll tell you why. I mean, I mean, who who's the number one person on the city and state list? Uh, is um, uh, Stanley Schlein. Stanley Schlein, who right, happens to be the. Uh, the Bronx Democratic attorney, and then they describe him as a consigliere. And he's also, you know, he's been, he's consulted all over the city, uh, including by several mayors, of course. So he definitely carries some level of clout. Um, and what, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I just pulled up the, the <laughs> photograph. I don't know if it's so over that. there. And okay. so, and also just the fact that they also have, they have Carl Hasty in their corner, and they also have, um, they also have Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr., who's a, you know, a contender. Um, the interesting thing, too, is the fact that, uh, I mean, Crespo himself is, is well-liked. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, when I was doing my research trying to get someone to speak, um, you know, sort of like not, not necessarily unfavorable, be a, a critic of him, I was it able was to... It was difficult to do that. Correct. Mm -hmm. and he's approachable. He's, you know, he wants to work with people. doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to agree with them on everything, but... Um, he's not willing to shut anyone out. From the Tell way me, you know, we talk about this program as um, being a clue into what people are thinking and doing. Talk to me about um, the, uh, like where you met him, where you conducted the interview. Was it a one-shot deal? Were you able to follow up? Because I know when you write a large piece like this, sometimes questions come up. Um, how did it work, and did you feel welcomed? Yeah, I mean, I, I essentially, he, he wanted me to go through his chief of staff, well, that, that's, there's nothing which, wrong with that. Uh, perfectly well, fine. Found dates and that sort of thing. And then, you know, he was he was You went me. to his office? Yeah, he was with me for a good hour and a half. Assembly and I, office? Or I did go to his assembly office. Interesting. And so, which is, yeah, I kind of... Uh, well, as that. opposed to the uh, Democratic Party office. Which he says, though, that they're in the middle... They're in the process of moving, apparently. Oh, yeah? It'd be yeah. the second or third time they've moved <laughs> in a couple of years. Later. And so, but but having met him, he actually gave me as much time as I needed. There was no, you know, you only have two hours with me. He didn't right. put a time stamp on it. I actually ended the interview in about 90 minutes in. Right. Um, and I thought I had gotten enough information from him uh, for me to put together this uh, this profile of him. You know, there, there's so much in here in, in terms of, you know, going through the conversations and various people commenting and all that kind of stuff. For you, what what ultimately emerges is in fact what ultimately emerges is that this is the last machine standing or what ultimately emerges is that uh, or maybe both that the Bronx Democratic County Committee is now slowly transforming itself in in this vision of new politics so to speak I think it's a little bit of both and I, oh, and I open it 
I open it in uh, in the second graph of the story. I essentially say it's kind of a, a kind of political survivalism for Crespo. He wants to he wants to adapt and he wants to go ahead and make some changes, but not radical to the point where he alienates um, mm. sort of like the establishment Democrats. And he needs to and also his he's trying to also embrace this new wave of progressive Democrats, and that's sort of like his. That's his job at this point to balance both of them, and he wants to do it. I mean, so you know, a, a question, and, and you and I have talked about it privately. Now I'm putting it right on the table. You know, my feeling is that there are some elected officials at the moment. I'm not going to name it, but there are some, and I'm not talking about what their politics are or whatever. But they're not responsive. That when people call their offices, they don't get the kind of callback. They don't get the fundamental services. I'm having a problem with my landlord, and you should have somebody who backs you or another problem. And there are elected officials who I believe do not really do a good job in, in serving constituents. And yet the county organization, uh, the Bronx Democratic County Committee, supports them when it comes to elections. Um, and so I, re and, and you know, because I, I talked to you about this, I believe that they should have a standard of performance, attendance, uh, you know, certainly a, a, a ethics uh, violation free uh, record, but they don't seem to do that. They'll just simply support the incumbents. They, yeah, exactly. I and that's a stated policy. And I did ask them in terms, I did ask uh, Crespo, why does that happen? And he essentially says, you want to respect the work that they've done in the past. And in terms of being sort of, especially, he was specifically speaking about Hispanic legislators who are still. I mean, we can talk about Carmen Arroyo and Jose Rivera, who have been there for a very long but time. But he says that they are trailblazers in the sense that they were able to break through a lot of barriers that a lot of would-be Hispanic legislators could not penetrate. Um, and so this is kind of payback. This is exactly Crespo is a you know he says he said to me he's the kind of person who respects his elders. And he says he's not wanting to be ageist. He just thinks that people have slowed down, but that should not take away from the work that they've done when they managed to penetrate what so many people were unable to do. Should members, and, and I, listen, I have asked um, uh, Marcos Crespo and Carl Hasty before him, and et cetera, et cetera, should members adhere to maybe a national democratic uh, a party agenda? For example, Marcos Crespo has not always been uh, you know, uh, uh, for a woman's right to choose. Uh, Senator Diaz is not for a woman's right to choose. Should they have standards of policy that uh, members adhere to? To have it uniform, is, it can be a little bit complicated because remember, you're thinking of a spectrum of Democrats. And so right. sometimes you have very blue, sometimes you have very moderate Democrats. Right. So to have a... Okay. Uh, uh, David, we are out of time. Uh, <laughs> folks, pick up the Norwood News. <laughs> David Cruz does an amazing job editing that. Uh, he did an amazing job. Pick up City and State. You can read all about David on the watch list of the Power 50. I and Michael Max from Bronx that were on the actual list. <laughs> it's all very well to do. Uh, but thank you for your work here, always in the Bronx, making the Bronx a better place. Thank you. Okay. Guys. We are going to say good night. Good night. We'll see you next time. This Monday night on Bronx Talk is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have two developers on there. We're going to talk about what's the nature of developing the borough of the Bronx. Get right inside. So uh, we'll see you then. Good night.